okay? All right. Let's jump into the message this morning. You know, last week we had uh, Lori's other brother last week, so we had a guest last week. Before that week, I started a two-week mini-series, and I, we called the mini-series Bottom Line. If you remember, if you were here two weeks ago, we started this series, and we called it Bottom Line. And I know the, that the, the, the phrase bottom line actually has a, a financial meaning. It's like the bottom line. What's, what's the bottom line? But we use that phrase in every day to, to kind of say, what's the bottom line? Get to the point. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Get to the point. What's the bottom line? What's the, what's the black and white? What's the black and white? And I told you, I think a couple weeks ago, there's only two kinds of people in this world. The bottom line people and the beat around the bush people. And I think I told you last week, I'm kind of a beat around the bush person, okay? I think I also said a couple weeks ago, if, if, if you're married, you're probably married to the opposite. If you're beat around the bush, you're probably married to a bottom line. If you're bottom line, you're probably, because, because I think I said this a couple weeks ago, two, two beat around the bush people probably would never get around to getting married. Okay? They just wouldn't. And, and two bottom line black and white people, oh, they'd kill each other. They just kill each other, right? So, so we're kind of either one or the other. But I tend to be, I tend to be a bit of a beat around the bush kind of person, okay? And I shared this a couple weeks ago, except when it comes to the Word of God. Except when it comes to spiritual matters. Because when it's a spiritual matter, this, the Word of God, is the bottom line. This is the bottom line. It really doesn't matter what I feel. This is the bottom line. It doesn't matter what I think. This, this is still the bottom line. And, and, and I, you'll catch me sometimes. I, I, it's not that I struggle with it, but, but I'm, I'm a beat around the bush. I'm a nice guy. I'm, I'm a nice guy. And there, and there are some times when I want to say, oh, it's okay. It's all right. That's all right. That's okay. God understands. And I actually am doing more harm. Let me give you an example. A, a believer struggling financially. Now, please understand my heart. A believer struggling financially. There's something inside of me that wants to say, it's okay. You don't need to tithe. You don't have to, you don't need to get for God. In fact, here's a hundred dollars, right? Here's a hundred bucks. There's something inside of me that wants to say that and do that. But I know from my own journey, from life experience, it's, it's, it's giving to God, tithing, and it's putting God first. That actually gets me out of some of the financial struggles I've been in. But I tend to sometimes want to be really soft and, and, and really nice. So, oh, oh, it's okay. It's all right. I know you love him. I know you love her. It's okay. What does the word of God say? What is the, man, they're, they're, listen, and I know some, most of you will relate to this. There have been times when I want to tell somebody, you got a right to be mad. Yeah, you, you have a right to get even. Yeah, they were wrong. Uh-uh. What is the bottom line? What does God's word says? God's word says to forgive them. And sometimes I hear some stories and I'm like, oh, I'd be mad too, man. Go get them. <laughs> Go get them. Right? No. Bottom line, no matter what I feel, no matter what you feel, no matter what I think sometimes. Bottom line, what does God's word say? What does his word say? So I started on that a, a few weeks ago. You know, that God's word is the bottom line. And, and, and I believe that God has a bottom line. God has a bottom line. So it led me to this study because God has a bottom line. So, so what does God want? What does God want? So I began to study that, and two weeks ago, I presented this to you. If God has a bottom line, then guess what? The devil has a bottom line too. The devil has a bottom line. Satan has a bottom line. Satan, the devil, wants something. He's got a bottom line, and he wants something. So two weeks ago, I'm not going to give you the whole message. You can go back on the website, and you can pick it up. I think it's what does the devil want would be the title. But we saw in Scripture the devil wanted, and I gave you three things. I'm not going to go through them all. But the devil wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be worshipped, and that's what got him kicked out of heaven. And we talked about that a little bit. I think I gave you a statistic that, that 60% of believers don't believe the devil is real. Don't believe in demons. Don't believe in any of that. Um, I, I was talking with Patricia this morning. Her brother had a, a surgery and had an experience. And I don't think he quite understood what he saw and experienced yet. 
But when he gets an understanding, ask him if there's really a devil. <laughs> ask him. He, he's he's going to come to that understanding. And I think most believers don't even believe. Uh, it, the, the statistic was over 60%. Don't believe there's a devil. Don't believe there's a demon. In other words, they don't believe they're in a fight. And I want to just tell you this morning, you're in a battle. You're in a fight. And, and it's time that we recognize it and realize it. So the devil wanted to be worshipped. Today, today, he still wants to be worshipped. He still wants to be worshipped. But now listen to me. The devil still wants to be worshipped today. But he's almost just as happy. He doesn't really, if you're not a devil worshipper, he, he's kind of okay with that. If you're not a devil worshipper, he's okay with that. As long as you're not worshipping the Lord our God. That's his goal. So what does the devil want? He doesn't want you and I to worship Jesus. He doesn't want us to worship the Lord. That was his goal. That's what the devil wants. So this morning, we're going to finish it up. What does God want? What does God want? And this kind of is going to lead into um, next week, Easter. Um, I, I was going to share this in the beginning, but I'll, I'll throw it in there now before we jump into this. How many of you have ever wondered on an Easter Sunday, what would Jesus teach? What would Jesus teach on Easter morning, on a Sunday morning? You want to find out? Come next week. <laughs> All right? Come next week. I was doing a fascinating study, and I was thinking, what would Jesus say? I think it will actually surprise you. So invite somebody out. You want to know what Jesus would have taught on Easter Sunday? Come next week and bring somebody with you. But what does God want? What does God want? Now, the, the beginning of what I'm going to teach you, I know I taught probably about a year ago, but this part is important because it sets a foundation so that I can show you what God wants, okay? So are you ready? You note takers, here's, here's point number one. It's probably up there on the board. God made me from him. God made me from him and out of him. I'm going to explain this really quickly because I know I've taught it before. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and possibly chapter 2. I'm not sure where it all ends. But the Bible talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. And it says that God, God created some things. But then it also says, and some people don't catch this, that God made some things. He created some things and he made some things. Now, there's a difference there's a difference there. And if you break it down in the Hebrew and, and things like that, to create means to make something out of nothing. And when he made things, to make, he, he, when he made something, and you'll see it in the scripture, he made something from something. He would make something out of something. Um, give you a quick illustration, okay? Ta-da! Um, my daughter made this cup, or her friend made this cup. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong cup. Okay. <laughs> hey. Someone made this cup, okay? <laughs> my daughter or her friend. So let's, let's just say it was my daughter this morning. So let's say my daughter comes to me and says, Dad, look, I created a cup for you. She didn't, did she? She didn't create this cup. Right? She didn't create this cup. It wasn't, it wasn't like Shazam, right? And there's a cup, right? She, she didn't do that. She couldn't do that, right? She took some clay. She took some clay, formed it, fired it, painted it, um, glazed it. I have no idea how you make a cup, okay? But she did all that work. She, she made it out of something. I'm going to move this so that I don't break it, okay? She made that cup out of something. That's the difference between creating and making. God created some things, and he made some other things. This is going to be important in just a moment. God said, let there be light. And bang, there was light. But now, watch this. Jump over to, if you've got your Bibles, your phones, whatever you're using, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And watch this. Genesis 11, 1 through 12. Then God said, let the, what? Let the earth, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And, and the earth, the earth brought forth grass and trees and all of the other kind of stuff. So follow me on this. Let the earth, God spoke 
God spoke to the earth. God spoke to the earth. He said, earth, bring forth. Earth, produce. And the earth obeyed God and, and began to produce fruit trees, grass, plants, all, all of these things. It obeyed the word of God. But those things came out of. God made them out of something else. Genesis 1, verse um, 24. Genesis 1, 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. So the, so the animals came, they, all, all of this came from the earth. Follow me on this. This will all make sense in just a moment. It came from the earth. They came from dirt. And not only did they come from dirt, but they're sustained by dirt. They eat the produce of the dirt, the ground, all of that kind of stuff. So they came from dirt, they're sustained by dirt, and they return to the dirt, okay? Follow me on this. When God made, because it says made, when God made things, he spoke what he wanted them to come from, what he wanted them to come out of. Here's why that's important. When God made man, he spoke to himself. He spoke to himself. Watch this, Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, not the earth, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, in the image of God. Are you following me on this? This is, this is really key in the sense that we, all of us, you, me, all of us, we came from God. We came from God. And listen, not only did we come from God, we're sustained by God. And, and we return to God. Now, if I got Bible scholars or some real thinkers out there, you're thinking, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Troy. Wait a minute, Troy. I know I read in my Bible somewhere. I know it's in there somewhere, Troy. But doesn't the Bible say that when God made me, that made Adam, that he just scooped up the dust of the earth, a handful of dirt, and made Adam? Come on, Troy. I think I kind of remember reading that. Listen, and, and here's the point in that. Adam's body, your body, my body, our bodies come from dirt and they're actually sustained by dirt right the fruits the plants the, all of that and our bodies actually return to dirt but here's the catch my spirit came from God and my spirit is sustained by God and my spirit returns to God my body, yeah, my body came from dirt, but my spirit, my spirit came from God. We came from God. You and I, all of us, Adam, we were made from God, okay? I know I taught that before, but then, and that's about as deep as I'm going to get. You could probably go on the web and get um, the message on that. But that was my first point. Here's the second one. Taking notes number two. God made me like him. That's the one that throws people sometimes. God made me like him. Back to, um, back to Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make men in our image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit of Trinity, picture of the Trinity. Here. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, according to the, the, the image of God. God made Adam in his image. Think about this now. Now think about it. Give it some thought. And, and, and again, I, I'm not sure how all of this, what it looked like and the, and the whole picture of it. But God made Adam in his image, in the image of God, according to God's likeness. And now think about it. Remember this first. There's no sin in the world. There's no sin in the world at this point in time. When Adam was, was made in the image of God, according to the, according to, in, in God's image, according to his likeness, there was no sin. Adam didn't sin. Adam hadn't had an impure thought at this point. There was no sin in the world. So think about it this way. Adam looks like God, talks like God, acts like God, thinks like God. He hasn't sinned, hasn't had an impure thought at all. God made someone in his image according to his likeness. So Adam was just like God. It's hard to fathom, huh? Some of you are like, see, I can see some of you, the wheels are spinning. You're like... Yeah, but yeah, just follow me, okay? He was made, Adam was made in the image of God, according to God's likeness. Now, we fast forward a little bit. Genesis 2, verse 20. So Adam gave, gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, underline this in your Bibles, there was not found, remember that, there was not found 
a helper comparable to him. There was not found. With, with that sentence right there, there was not found implies what? They must have been looking, right? There was not found. Hey, Adam, name all these animals. And there was not found. It just implies that they must have been looking for a companion for Adam. So can I suggest to you something like this? Adam, maybe to God. God, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I got the garden, and man, it's, it's, it's beautiful. This garden is incredible. And God, I got you to talk to anytime I want. That's awesome. That's incredible. But, but there's something, Adam's talking about, there's something that I want. And I, and I don't really know what it is, but I have this desire in my heart. I have this want, and I don't really know what it is. So in the Bible, this is my interpretation of it. So the Bible, God says, okay, Adam, okay, name all the animals, name all the animals. And while you're naming them, see if there's kind of one that stands out, right? See if there's one that you'd like to be a helpmate, a companion. Now, I, I, I have a pretty imaginative mind, so, and I, I know I've shared this times, and I would try not to get too off track, but I think about all the animals coming in front of Adam and him naming them. Can you imagine that, though? Just, I mean, it kind of blows me away when I really, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible, I'm getting off track, um, where, where God says that we have dominion over all the animals of the earth, and I think we struggle with that, Right? But come on, think about that just for a moment. This is totally off track. I don't know why. Have you ever been to a circus and there's a man standing there with maybe a chair and he has this lion submitting to him? You go to India and they're riding elephants, right? Um, SeaWorld, they're swimming with sharks and stuff. I believe it's true that we do have dominion over all the animals. And, and so, so I'm believing Adam, Adam is standing there and these animals are just lined up. Now, Adam, imagine Adam's thinking, a giraffe. Has anybody ever stood next to a giraffe? I've never have. But those, those guys are, look, look like incredible animals to me. But could you imagine Adam just looking at that giraffe? Wow, that's really cool. It's not really going to work out, but, but that's really cool. So he's got all these animals. And I think, I think, I think a cat walked by and he's like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But, but, but I think, sorry, cat lovers. I think do, a dog walked by. And Adam looked at that dog and he said, wow, that's cool. You're not really going to be a companion, but you can be my best friend, okay? And that's where that came from, in case you were ever wondering. It is in the Bible that a dog is a man's best friend, okay? It's not in the Bible. I'm kidding, all right? But, but so imagine all of that going on. And there was no companion found for Adam. So they must have been looking. They must have been looking. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. You know the story. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. He takes one of Adam's ribs out of him while he's sleeping, and he fashions, he forms a woman. Adam wakes up, and there she is, Eve. And she's beautiful. And Adam's like, that's what I'm missing. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. And please listen to me, because I was thinking about this as I was preparing. Women... I should get a really big amen out of this, okay? Women are no less than man just because a woman was made from, just because a woman came out of man and man came out of God. A woman is no less than man because, listen to me, the same breath of God that breathed into Adam breathed into Eve. So there is, there are, there is one, one is not less, and listen, you want to think about it this way? Body-wise, Think about it this way. Adam was formed out of dirt. At least a woman was formed out of a rib, right? So, I mean, it's already, and, and if you read, actually read the, 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 the Bible, the, the original trans, it, the Bible says that, that God formed man. And, and the, the, the definition of formed is actually squeezed. It means squeezed. So if you picture it that way, it's like God grabbed a handful of dirt, and there's man. Okay, the Bible says when God made Eve, it said he fashioned her. He fashioned, I'm so glad he did. Amen, come on, come on, I'm so glad he did, right? He fashioned her. So if you're ever thinking, well, Adam came from God and Eve came from Adam. No, 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 they're equal. They're equal. They're both created in the image of God and the breath of God was breathed into both of them. Now, when, I'm, when I used to read that story, I used to think, I used to think Adam wanting, wanting a companion, 
Adam wanting a companion, I used to think that that might have disappointed God. I used to think that would disappoint God because, because I think like most of us think, and you're lying this morning if you don't think this way, but I think, I think we think sometimes, am I not good enough, right? Am I not good enough for you? You want something else? And I used to think that God would be like that. I would think, oh, man, Adam wants something other than me. That's really not the case. That's really not the case. In, in fact, a better question to ask would be this one. You ready? How did God know that the only thing that would satisfy Adam's desire and Adam's want was a bride? You ever think about that? How did God know? How did God know? Because Adam was like, I'm missing something. I don't really know what it is. And it's not a giraffe. It's not, God, I'm missing something. How did God know? How did God know that the only thing that would satisfy Adam's want and desire was a bride? See, now, now follow my train of thought here because we're trying to figure out what God wants. And God makes somebody exactly like him. He makes something exactly like him. And the one he makes desires something, wants something. You follow my train of thought? We're trying to figure out what God wants, and God makes a replica of himself. And that thing that that, that, that replica wanted, God knew exactly what he wanted. How did God know that the only thing that would satisfy Adam's want and desire was a bride? You ready for the answer? God has the same desire and the same want. You see, he knew what Adam wanted because God wanted the same thing. What does God want? I'm going to tip you off before we get all the way done with the message. Do you know what God wants? God wants a bride. God wants a bride. He wants you and you and you and all of us. God wants, you're what God wants most. You're, you have been, you and I, all of us, we've been created to be loved by God and to love him back. God, and you, and you know this, but I've got to get you to follow my train of thought. God created you, will, all of us. God created us with a will because only a person with a will can actually love. Only somebody with, with a will can actually love. Today, I was thinking about this. Today, we're kind of big, at least our society is, we're big on AI. How many of you know what that stands for? Not Alan Iverson, okay? My kids are like, oh, no, no, AI, okay? Artificial intelligence. And we're kind of big on that. You see it a lot in Hollywood. How many of you, and I think it's an okay movie. You, I can actually ask you, and you can raise your hand without being convicted, okay? How many of you have ever seen uh, Will Smith, iRobot? Okay, I think it's clean. I sure hope it was. I saw it on TV. I didn't see it at the theater, okay? You ever see a movie at the, at, on TV and recommend it to somebody, and then they rent the DVD, and you're like, oh! okay. If iRobot is bad, I saw it on TV, and there was nothing bad, all right? But, but if you've ever seen the movie, it's like, it's Will Smith, and, and, and they've created these, these robots that, that are like almost close to being human, right? And they're such helpers. They're such, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing housework. They're doing cleaning. They're working. They're doing all these great things. But the problem in the movie is, is you find out they tried to create this one robot to have emotion, emotions. But it can't. It, it can't. I watch a lot of sports. It's about all I watch on TV. Do you ever see that Allstate commercial? Anybody else? My kids probably again, right? And they, they send this robot agent. Allstate agent to, to make a claim on the guy's car. And the one guy's like, yeah, but they don't have any emotion. Remember that one, anybody? And the robot's like, yes, I do. I'm so sorry for your car. And he's got eyes and it's like a jet stream of tears, you know, but it's like full spray water. And he's like crying, oh. Robots can't have emotion, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll we, we may, I mean, you got AI, you've got cars now and everything else. Here's what we'll never see. <laughs> I labeled it AE. You're never going to see artificial emotion. Because I think it's literally impossible. I think it's impossible. Imagine, imagine a robot somehow in your house saying to you basically, I love you. And maybe you're like, oh, that is so sweet. That is so sweet. Oh, why do you love me? 
because I'm programmed <laughs> to love you, right? I mean, that would, that, would pretty much, that would pretty much sum it up, right? That's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So, so here's my third and last point. This one, this one kind of wraps it all together. Number three, God made me to love him. God made you to love him. Man, I could go a long time on this one, okay? And I had so many thoughts, so many thoughts. If you know me, some of them are crazy thoughts, but I just had so many thoughts. But one of my first thoughts was because, because this bride and this groom, the Bible talks a lot about the marriage feast of the lamb, if you know what I'm talking about. It's all pictured in a wedding feast and in a marriage. So I began to think about this, and I was thinking about Jewish custom way back then. And, 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 it, and this whole picture is kind of like, I'm going to correct this in a moment. It's not completely like. It's kind of like a prearranged marriage, right? Come on, how many of you have ever seen, and I, they may still do it in Israel, I don't know, or, or, in, or in some other cultures, they may still do it. But how many of you know what, like a prearranged marriage, I'm so, how many of you are so glad we don't do that here? My kids, I'm sure, are glad. I'm, a prearranged marriage in, in back in the day was basically, hey, hey, I'm going to give you my daughter, my daughter, I'm going to give my daughter to your son, but I want two cows, a chicken, and a rooster, okay? And, and, but here's the thing about that, and it's all arranged. It's all arranged, ready? Like it or not. Oh, well, you'll learn to love him, right? <laughs> you will learn to love him. It's all prearranged. It's all taken care of. It's, it, it's all arranged. Now, now, that, now, follow me. Stay with my train of thought here, okay? And just kind of roll with me. I know this isn't just 100% correct, but you'll get the picture, okay? God the Father wants a bride for his son. God, our Heavenly Father, God the Father wants a bride for his son. And he's like this. He's like, I have paid for everything. I have paid for everything. Everything is taken care of. I paid for it all. Everything you will need from now and all of eternity, I've taken care of. It's all done. I paid the full price. I paid for it all. It's all been arranged. It's all been arranged. He's like, it's all been arranged, and I want you. 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 And it's even deeper than that if you really think about it, because he's really like, I want them. Oh, I want that group over there. And I want those people out there. Even that homeless guy? Yeah, I even want that homeless guy. Well, what about that gangbanger? I even want that gangbanger. I even want that murderer. And God's like, I love them. I love them. I want them. I want them. I love them. But now, here's where that illustration breaks down, okay? The old days, it's all arranged, like it or not. Here's where it breaks down a little bit because it's a little different. You don't have to say yes. You see, God's looking for a bride. God's planning a wedding, and it's been prearranged, but you don't have to say yes. You don't, not like the olden days. No, you're marrying them. I already got the cow. I already got the, you're married them. You're stuck. That's not the way God works. God's like, man, I've paid for everything. I've taken care of everything. But you still, get, you still have a choice. You get to say yes or no. He's arranged it. He's taken care of everything. But it's your choice. God is like, man, I love you so much. And this is what he's saying to us even today. I love you so much. I want to spend every moment with you. I've taken care of everything. Will you be my bride. That's what he's saying. Will you be my bride? I love you. Will you be my bride? But now, now, now here's the problem. We hear that, and I don't know about you before you were saved or when you first got saved, and even people outside of the church, we hear that, and our first response is, okay, yeah, yeah. So many have said yes to God, not taking seriously the covenant that they're actually entering into. They've actually said yes to God. They've said, yes, I want to be your bride. I do. Not understanding or not taking serious this covenant that they've entered into. Listen to me. This is a big kind of a heavy statement. 
God's not looking for a bride who's going to cheat on his son. God is not looking for a bride who's going to cheat on his son. No, no. Ladies, follow me on this train of thought. I don't know who a popular movie actor is today, so I got to go with Brad Pitt, okay? Because that's the only guy that reminds me of me. All right? So, (laughs) just kidding. All right. Ladies, ladies, imagine. Ladies, imagine. If Brad Pitt would just marry me, I, I, I wouldn't care. I don't care if he never comes home. I don't care if he cheats on me. It's okay if he doesn't talk to me. It's okay if he doesn't want to spend any time with me at all. I don't care if he reads the love letters that I've written to him. At least we're married. Ladies, come on. No. And none of you are going to do that. If you want the last name Pitt, then just change your name, okay? Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to do that. But yet, but follow my train of thought, yet we think God should be happy. We think God should be happy with a bride who doesn't care to spend much time with him. We think God should be happy with a bride that doesn't care to spend much time. We think God should be happy with a bride who doesn't care to talk to him that much or to talk to him at all, unless, of course, we need something, right? Unless we need something. We think God should be okay with someone who has other loves besides him. We think God should be okay. We think God should be okay with somebody who doesn't even care or want to read his letters, his love letters to us. You see, we think, oh, God should... We honestly, honestly, we think God should be happy to have me. Would you be? Would you be? Think about that. Would you be? I wrote this down. When Lori said I do to me, when my wife said, when Lori said I do, when she said yes to me, when she said yes to me, you know what she was saying? She's saying no to Fred, no to Elmer, no to... Bartholomew, no, she was, when she said, when she said yes to me, she's saying no to everybody else. And listen, when I asked her to marry me, she didn't say, okay, yes, but just for the first two weeks of every month. And then the other two weeks, I get to do whatever I want to do. How many of you know that's a deal breaker? Sorry. Okay. It's like, sorry, babe, forget it, I'm moving on, right? That, that'd be a deal breaker. Now, 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 follow me on this train of thought, because I thought about this the other day. Don't answer this out loud, because I am going to ask you a question. I want you to think about it and don't answer. If God came to you and said, I want to spend, God speaking to you, don't answer out loud. God came to you and said, I want to spend all my time with you. Think about it for a minute. And I mean, give it some real thought. God comes to you and says, I want to spend all my time with you. Now, now I know automatically, intentionally, I think intentionally we'd all say, absolutely. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But listen, think about that for a moment and really give it some thought. Because I think there's something in the back of our, our minds that would kick in sooner or later that would be like, Hmm, how much time is that? (laughs) How much time is that really? Because you know, God, you know, I've got school, I've got work, I've got these kids, I've got this wife, I've got this, I like to play basketball every now and then. How much time are we talking here? How much time? And listen, listen to me. All those things are good, right? God gave you that wife. God gave you that job, I hope, right? God, God's given you some of those things. Um, it, it's kind of like this. Let's say, let's say Lori, um, my wife Lori, let's say Lori wants to go out to lunch with Pastor Toyin every Wednesday. So every Wednesday, Pastor Lori and Pastor Toyin go out to lunch. And Lori comes home. Man, I have such a great time. When I go out to lunch with Pastor Toyin, she's so fun to be with. She's so, she's such a joy. She so encourages me. Man, I just have a blast when I go out to lunch with Pastor Toyin. Is that okay? It's absolutely okay. But as, as, as a groom, as a husband, and even for the wife, 
there, there's this thing that should happen every once in a while, maybe more often than not. But, but what should happen sometimes is, is my wife should come home or would, would come. She, I just know she would, okay? My wife will come home and say, man, I had a wonderful lunch with Pastor Toy, and man, it was just so good. She's so fun to be with. And, and, but you know, honey, I, 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 was, I was talking with Pastor Toyin, and my mind started to drift. And I was thinking of you. Or I was sitting there with lunch with Pastor Toyin, and she was sitting across from me, and she said the exact same thing you would say. And I, could, I almost pictured you sitting across from me, and I almost wanted to give her a big hug. And then, and then we had a wonderful lunch. I had a wonderful time. And then, then we, when I left, I thought, man, I had a nice lunch with Pastor Toyin, but I can't wait to have dinner with my man. I know that's what she's thinking most of the time, okay? But now, now follow my train of thought here, okay? Follow me. That's, that's love. That is love. That's love. And, and, and here's what I'm thinking. Here's, here's God's way of looking at this. Here's God's way, I think it is at least, okay? I don't want to speak for God. But, but this is God in, in at least the way I picture it. Listen, you're at work. You're at work. And listen, I, I, I am not putting down, in fact, I want to encourage, I'm not criticizing people who work hard, who are dedicated to their jobs, even for those who, who put in a lot of hours, okay? Uh, man, I used to be working in a warehouse, and I know my kids are in retail. Listen, there are seasons and things that go on. And, 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 and so work is not bad, amen? So please do not miss my train of thought here, okay? How many times, how, how, how many of you have ever heard, been asked this question, or, and I hate this question, but I'll say it anyway. Um, how's the question go? Do you spend more time at work or more time with God? I used to hate that question because I'm thinking, I want to slap somebody. It's like, come on, man. Every, most people, anybody that's got a job, right? Anybody that's got a job, they spend more time. That's not even a fair question, okay? It's not even a fair question. And, and it's, I thought it's not even a, a, a right question because it's probably all of us. So, so back to my point here. So you're at work. Now, think about it this way. And this is what God is looking for. You're at work and your thoughts kind of drift. Your thoughts drift to that word that God gave you that morning in your quiet time, in your Bible reading time. You're at work, and all of a sudden, you're thinking about God. And I picture God to be like, yeah, he's at work, but he's thinking of me. But he's thinking of me. How many of you have ever had a worship service in your car? I've had some amazing, man, I sound good in my car. I'm just letting you know now. I sound good. Man, I have had some incredible worship services in my car. And I picture that, and I think, you know, God is probably watching that thinking, yeah, he's driving to work. Yeah, she's driving to school, but she's singing to me, to me. You understand where I'm coming from? And I, I was actually out, um, some of you will understand a lot of this. I was actually out shooting some baskets. I was out there by myself, just shooting some baskets. Uh, Friday, I believe it was, Thursday or Friday. And I started shooting baskets. And if you play basketball, you know there's such a thing as a good day and a bad day when you're shooting, okay? When everything just goes in and then when nothing goes in, right? So I was having a good day and I made quite a few in a row. And if you know what happened, I think at the end of last year, dislocated this shoulder, tore some things up in there. And if you remember the story, a doctor wanted to do a surgery, basically cut off my arm and put it back on to me just so I'd be able to do this after the surgery. Okay, he wanted to do this surgery because at the time I couldn't even do anything. He wanted to do a surgery so I could do that, that I'm doing now anyway. Thank you very much, doctor. Actually, thank you, God. So I'm out there shooting baskets, having a good day, and I was shooting. Notice how that works now? Really nice because of God. Okay. God said, you know what? I don't want one of my worshipers to only be able to go like that, okay? I want him to be able to raise his hands, okay? So I believe God touched me and healed me, okay? So I'm out there shooting, and it's like boom. Boom, boom, and, and, and just a usual basketball shooting turned into a time where I'm just praising God. Every shot I made, even if it didn't go in, I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it was funny. I don't always do this, but it was kind of fun. So I started shooting around. If you know anything about basketball, I started shooting some threes. And I'm thinking, three. Is that how they do it? 
or the other way. I'm thinking three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then I went and shot a couple twos, and I'm thinking, God, it's just you and me. It's just you and me. And then I was shooting some free throws, and I, these things were just coming to my head. I'm shooting some free throws, and I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that I am free to throw my arms around you. I'm free to throw my, my affection and everything. And then I did a couple layups, and I'm thinking, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. This time of just playing basketball, I believe God is like watching, thinking, yeah, he's playing basketball. Ah, oh, but he's praising me. He's worshiping me. He's with me. And I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking. That's love. That's love. That's love. That's what God is looking for. He wants to love us, pour out all of his love on us. But listen to me. He wants us to love him in return. That's what he's looking for. This marriage that God's talking about, just because God has paid for everything, just because God has taken care of everything, all of it, it doesn't mean that it's a one-sided marriage. God wants to be loved. God wants to love and to be loved. It is, it is really that simple. I'm wrapping it up right here. God, if you know anything about God, you know that God is a giver. You know that God is a giver. That's his character. That's his nature. It's almost as if God, if God receives anything, it has to go back out. That's just his character. That's his nature. Uh, that's a principle of God. It's just who he is. If it comes in, it's got to go back out. It's got to go back out. And I say that to tell you this. If you touch God, listen to me. If you touch God, God will touch you. If you touch him, he will touch you. And that's important. That's important because I think, I think too many times people, a lot of times people will come into church and they'll sit through a whole service of worship, prayer, and a message, and they'll leave and they're like, man, I just didn't get anything. I just didn't get anything out of the service. You want to know why? You want to know why? Because you didn't give anything. Because I can guarantee you this. If you give to God, and I'm not talking about money, if you give to God, God will give to you. You won't walk out. Oh, I didn't get anything. Listen, listen, it's a time of worship. I honestly, you have to, I don't care how good or bad worship is. Quality, I, I do. Back up. Okay. Ignite Church, we want to do everything with the spirit of excellence. So please don't misunderstand me. That. But listen, come on. I don't care in the sense that if you come in and say, I didn't get anything out of worship. It just wasn't very good this morning. They didn't sing any of my favorite songs. Um, So-and-so didn't. It, it just wasn't very good. I didn't get anything out of it. Listen to me. If you touch God in worship, he will touch you in worship. If you touch God in prayer, he will touch you in prayer. That's the kind of God we serve. You, you give to God, he gives back. You touch God, he, he will touch you back. When you touch God, he touches you. But it's your choice. It's your, it's your choice. Man, it's so much more. It's so much more than just saying yes and repeating a prayer. When God says, man, I love you so much and I want you to be my bride, it's so much more than just saying yes. It's so much more than saying I do or just repeating this prayer after me. Let me show you a verse. Verse real quick. I'm going to read this story. Last two verses. Matthew 25, 1 through 10. Last two set of verses, okay? I don't want to anybody to say, you said two verses. Matthew 25, verse 1 to 10. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened, whoa, 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 back up. Then the what? Kingdom of heaven. What he's showing you is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels, vessels with their lamps. But when the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, no. Least there, should be, least there shall not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were what? Those who were what? Were ready. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Those who were ready 
Are you following me? Those who were ready, listen to me. Ten said yes. Five got ready. Ten said yes. Ten said, yeah, I want to be the bride. Five got ready. Let me give you one more verse, two more verses, actually. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, his bride, us, and his bride has made herself what? Ready. Who made herself ready? The bride. The bride has made herself ready. Listen to me. That's your job. That's my job. It's your job. God wants a bride. God wants to love and he wants to be loved. But he's looking for a bride who will make herself ready. Who will make her. Now here's the beauty of that verse. Just one more verse. This I promise is the last verse. The very next verse. Revelation 19.8. She has been what? Given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. She has been given. Here's what I'm telling you. God's looking for a bride, and he says, and that bride needs to make herself ready. That bride needs to prepare herself. But here's the good thing. Everything has been provided for you and I. Everything you need to get ready, everything you need to be prepared, God has already provided for you. Listen, you don't have to buy it. You couldn't. You can't, you can't earn it. You can't earn it. It's been paid for. It's been taken care of. It's all been, back to our first illustration, it's all been arranged. It's all been arranged. So get ready. So get ready. I was thinking about this. I've done a lot of weddings as a pastor. I've done a lot of weddings. And I think I can safely say this, and most of you would agree, I have never seen an ugly bride, okay? Okay. And it's like every bride I've ever seen, they're prepared. Man, they're ready. Think about the weddings you've been to. Is the bride usually ready? They're pre- Come on. How many times have you ever been to a wedding and you've either said or heard somebody saying, oh, the groom. Oh, the groom looked beautiful. Oh, his slacks, that bow tie. Oh, and I think he did something different with his hair. He just looked, oh, amazing, right? You never hear that. You never hear that about a groom. But what do you hear about a bride? Whoo, baby, she was prepared, right? Oh, she was ready. She looks so good. She looks so good. Why? Because they're prepared. They're ready. That's what God's looking for. You see, we talked about a couple weeks ago. Satan wants to be worshipped, but God wants a bride. He just wants a bride. He wants you. He wants me. He's someone that he can love and someone who will love him back. Who will love him back? Someone, someone that, 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 that he, wants to, he wants to spend his life with you. And, 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 and as I was preparing for this, and I'm speaking to the men now. How many of you just, when, I think, when that thought comes through my mind, I get to be a bride. I gotta, I'm just being honest with you for a minute. That does nothing for me as a man, okay? Just makes me feel like a wimp kind of in some ways, right? I get to be a bride. Hooray, right? It actually just, if you're a man out there this morning, you're struggling with this whole concept like, God wants me to be his bride? Hey, listen to me this morning, okay? Deal with it, I guess. Deal with it. Embrace it. Embrace it and get ready. And get ready. This Bible, it's not a book of rules. It's not a book of do's and don'ts. The word of God is I'm just going to use this word. It's a crazy love story. It really is. It's a love story about God who is crazy in love with his creation, who will do anything for them, has done everything for them, has prepared the way, has taken care of everything, and he's waiting for them to say yes. He's waiting for them at this marriage feast that the, that the Bible talks about, and he's waiting for them. But he's waiting for those, not only that he loves, and, but the, not only those, but those who will love him in return. Those, but follow me, I'm, I promise I'm wrapping it up. Those who will love him and make themselves ready. And make themselves ready. You see, I think that's part of the problem in the church today. 
we all hear God loves us and wants us and this and that. Okay, yes. But the church isn't making herself ready today. And that's what I want to encourage you in. That's what I want to encourage you in. Are you ready to be the bride of Christ? What does God want? God wants a bride. He wants you. He wants me. And, and, and I am actually done, but I was trying to figure out, how could I close this message? And I thought, oh, we could have a marriage ceremony, right? And have everybody stand up and you say, I do, or yes to God, okay? Relax, I'm not going to do that, okay? Because I'm believing this morning most of you already have. I'm actually believing this morning most of you already have. What I really want you to do this morning is to rethink, rethink the covenant that you have actually entered into. Rethink that covenant that, that you have actually entered into and begin to think this. Is he the love of my life? Is he the love of my life? Because listen to me, he wants to be. And you're his. <laughs> and you're his. Amen? I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you as you leave this morning, even this afternoon. But I want you to really dig deep and examine yourself. Am I ready? Have I prepared myself as a, as a bride to Christ? Is he everything to me? I want to encourage you in your thoughts this, this, this afternoon and begin to think that and dwell that over. Have you taken this covenant, this commitment you've made with God, have you taken it seriously? Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the message. You can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or online at ignitechurchoc.com.